Yes, we can okay. see that. You can see it. Oh, and we're not on the right slide though. Let me just see why not. There we go. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, as Christoph told you, I'm Ellie Ledbeater and I work at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, so one of the loveliest things about working at Royal Holloway is despite its name, it's not actually in London. It's on the edge of London, um, which means we're surrounded by beautiful ancient parkland, we're surrounded by gardens, we've got woodland, and that makes it a really nice place to study foraging bees. And we study honeybees, as Christoph said, so we've got an apiary um, out in the field on campus, but we also study bumblebees, um, also out in the wild as well as in the lab. And I'm gonna to talk to you about both species or species groups today. First of all, I have to apologize because the title of my talk has changed slightly. I was going to talk to you entirely about the waggle dance because to be honest, that is my, my favorite thing about bees. Um, uh, but yesterday I came back from holiday and I caught up with some of the other seminars that have been given in the series. And I was watching Maggie Kuvalong's excellent seminar. And I realized that actually the material in, or some of the material in mine was very similar to the material in hers. So I quickly, decided to um, add some of the work that we've been doing on um, bumblebees and, repl and replacing some of the, the things I was going to talk about about dance decoding to avoid giving a kind of paler imitation of, of Maggie's talk. So I hope the bumblebee stuff is uh, interesting for you as well. So the new title of my talk is um, Ecology Shapes the Evolution of Bee Foraging Cognition. And uh, I want to start off by explaining to you what exactly I mean by that. Okay, so I'd like you to start by just picturing the, the foraging challenge that faces a social bee. So this is a picture that I took of a wildflower meadow on our campus a couple of years ago. And you can see that there's an awful lot of flowers out there, but we have to bear in mind that every single one of those flowers, if it contains nectar at all, it contains a tiny, tiny package of it which means that bees have to visit a huge number of them in order to, to fill their crop. And pollen also comes in very small packets, right? So that means that every foraging bout involves visiting hundreds of flowers in order to, co to collect enough nectar uh, to make it worthwhile and to go back to the colony. And those foraging bouts are repeated over and over and over again, unlike a, a, a non-social animal that would just be foraging for itself, because worker bees are foraging for the colony, right? So there are thousands of flower visits involved here. And to make those visits, they're also going a very long way in some circumstances. So this map down here, can you see, can you see my cursor? Now, Christoph, tell me if you can't see the cursor. Yeah, um, I can see it. Okay, good. Uh, so here we've got a heat map of one of our honeybee colonies um, foraging areas. The hive is at the center of the map and the radius of this is two kilometers. So you can see that our bees are really going a very long way, especially for such a, a tiny thing, um, to find food. And they, they actually go much further than this, as I'm sure many of you know, they can go up to 14 kilometers. So that's energetically really expensive. So because they're kind of, they're investing so much energy and they have to go to so many flowers to find food, that means that anything that makes that process more efficient should be under really strong selection, right? Anything that can make that process or make them collect more nectar, more pollen um, in a shorter time sh should be good. And of course, we see some really amazing uh, adaptations, foraging traits in bees, which seem to have evolved to, to fulfill that purpose of making foraging more efficient. So for example, it's now fairly well accepted that bees are surprisingly good at learning, learning and memory. And I say surprising because they've got such small brains and they seem to be able to do so much with them. So they're really good about learning which flower species are currently rewarding, which patches are rewarding, uh, where to go, all that kind of thing. They can even do some stuff that you'd think, well, what, what is the, the relevance of that? And things like having a concept of sameness and difference and a concept of zero and all this kind of thing, doing with a very small brain, which seems to, or we assume makes foraging more efficient. 
So we see these kind of individual level adaptations, but we also see some, some group level behaviors that seem to have evolved specifically to make foraging more efficient. And the, the classic example of that would be the famous waggle dance, which allows honeybees to recruit their nest mates uh, to particular, to good foraging resources that they found. And it's these traits that have always kind of really interested me throughout my research career so far. And I'm interested in them from kind of both approximate perspective, so how do they work, and an ultimate perspective of, of how and why, why they evolve. What I want to do today is just talk you through two case studies of the kind of approach that we've taken to studying those traits. So the first one is going to be approximate one. That's where I'm going to talk about um, work that we've been doing on the waggle dance and how it fits into the different the network of communication that goes on inside the hive. And in the second part of the talk, I'm going to take a more ultimate perspective and look at um, what drives the evolution of memory, which ecological selection pressures are important. So let's start with the proximate question. Um, so this is about the honeybee waggle dance. Now, it's obligatory in a talk about honeybees to have this picture of Carl von Frisch um, doing his research in Austrian national dress. Um, I'm sure I don't have to tell this audience that it was Carl von Frisch who first um, describes uh, the honeybee waggle dance, and how recruits or how uh, bees inside the hive are recruited to particular food sources. Um, but just to give you a reminder of how the waggle dance works, here's a video. So we can see here a dancing bee, she's the one with the green and white dots, and she's found a food source outside the hive and she's dancing to tell her nestmates uh, where it is. And the way that she does that is um, she tells them about the distance to the food source that's um, indicated in this central waggle run that you can see when she's shaking from side to side. So the duration of that indicates the distance and uh, the direction is indicated in the angle of this waggle run to the top of the hive. So you can see she's, she's, she's waggling at about, let's say it's about nine o'clock to the top of the hive, which means go out of the hive, look for the sun or the sun's azimuth and turn through nine o'clock and fly in that direction. Okay, so it's quite an amazing um, form of animal communication. And as I said, this was, this was the thing as an undergraduate that made me want to study bees. Now, when the waggle dance was first described by von Frisch, it certainly wasn't accepted um, by everybody that, this, um, uh, that bees were able to use the information in the waggle dance to find food. And one of the most kind of vocal opponents of von Frisch was um, this guy. So this is Adrian Venner. And Venner accepted that the dancing bees or the dancers inside the hive correlated with the um, distance and direction that the dancers had flown. But what he found harder to accept or what he justifiably questioned um, was whether we could be sure that the, that the follower bees were using that information to find the food. And the reason why he questions that is probably familiar to some people, but I want to go over it because it's important to the question that we asked in our research. Um, the reason or the, the problem that he had was if you imagine a hive like this with several food sources around it and you train a cohort of bees to let's say this food source here and they go back to the hive, they dance in the hive and uh, recruited bees arrive, or potentially recruited bees arrive at the feeder. Well, they could arrive because they use the information in the dance, but that feeder also has a particular odor associated with it. Maybe that's the odor of the food source itself, or maybe that's the odor um, of the environment surrounding the feeder, or maybe it's the odor of the foraging bees themselves producing um, foraging pheromones. So it's very hard to rule out the idea that odor could be important. And this is something that actually kind of plagued von Frisch throughout his career, all up until he was, um, and beyond when he was uh, awarded his Nobel or share of the Nobel Prize. And it wasn't von Frisch that kind of finally devised an experiment that could kind of um, finally kind of put rest to this idea. 
um, it was uh, James Gould, who was at the time um, when he started his experiments, a PhD student at the University of California. And what Gould did was one of the kind of, I think is one of the cleverest experiments that um, I've ever heard about. He effectively persuaded the dancing bees to lie about where they had found their food. And to understand how he did that, it's important to know that if you put a light source inside a hive, then instead of orientating towards the top of the hive to indicate the sun, then uh, bees instead orientate towards or use the light source to represent the sun instead. It makes sense, right? You have a big light in the hive, use that to represent the big light in the sky. So you can change the kind of the, the, um, uh, the reference point that the bees use. So what Gould did was he trained a cohort of bees to forage at a particular feeder, say this one. He let them go back to the hive to dance, but those bees that he trained didn't know that there was a light on inside the hive. The reason they didn't know was because he had painted over the light sensitive cells on the top of their heads. Um, so they couldn't or didn't detect the light that was on. So they were using the top of the hive to orientate their dances. The other bees in the hive had not been blinded in that way. And so they were using the light to orientate their dances. And for them, uh, another feeder was indicated. And lo and behold, enough bees turned up at this alternative feeder um, to convincingly show that the bees were using the information in the waggle dance to find food. So this was a really uh, kind of um, crucial, critical experiment, really impressive experiment. And it showed that when everything else is equal, when you know, there are no odor cues coming in that could tell you anything else and all your feeders at equal distances, and um, then bees definitely can use the dance to find a food source. But the problem that um, Gould himself identified was the fact that the real world isn't necessarily like that. So this is a painting of um, just a farm lane in uh, the Vale of York, which is where I'm from. It's a really agricultural place. There's not a lot of flowers around usually, but you can see even somewhere like this, there's an awful lot of information that comes into a honeybee hive, uh, odor information that is. So here we've got the cow parsley, we've got the oilseed rape, we've got whatever's up here, you know, presumably some kind of fruit tree or something like that. All these odors are coming into the hive. The bees have their own memories of these food sources as well. They have, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so they're getting information about dances, but they're getting all this odor information as well. And it's that fact that led Gould himself to, to um, question how important the dance was in kind of normal foraging. And what he said at the end of his paper, which I think sums it up really nicely, is he said, the inherently spectacular nature of the dance language may have helped to emphasize it out of all proportion to its actual place in ecology and foraging. Only further work can establish whether the dance language is common or real under normal circumstances. And that's the question that we wanted to take up with um, our empirical research. We know that bees can use the dance, but we want to know when, when do they use it over um, odor cues. So the question is how important is the waggle dance in recruitment. We wanted to quantify, we didn't want to say, oh, they use odor or they use dances. We know that they use both. We wanted to know under what circumstances is the dance most important in driving bees to food. And to do that, we used a technique called network-based diffusion analysis. Now you might think, well, where does, where does the network come in here? And I just want to show you a video of, um, the inside of a hive during one of our trials. So you can see, here's a dancing bee. She is dancing to show uh, the other bees where she's found food, but she's also pausing and giving nectar samples to, um, to other bees inside the hive. And she also smells of the, of the food source that she's visited. So they can antenate her and smell the food. Now you can think of her dances <clears throat> as kind of forming a, a network in this way, so she dances with these bees. Yeah, they follow her dances. 
and they go out to look for food and some of them maybe find the same food source as her and they come back to the hive and they dance. So they form the next stage of the network. And then maybe some of those followers go out and find the food and they dance for the same food source. So the network kind of develops this dance network, this, uh, um, these connections between dancers and followers that become dancers <clears throat> builds up over time. And, but at the same time, there's another network forming. So the same bee, she's, she's dancing, but like I said, she's also giving nectar samples through trophallaxis. So she's forming her trophallactic network. And again, those recipients from go out, find the same food source and <clears throat> perform trophallaxis with other bees, etc. So we have these different networks going on inside the hive or forming inside the hive. And we want to know which, <clears throat> which ones are the most important in driving the bees to food. So how would you do that? Well, I just want to step back for a minute from bees and move over to dolphins for a minute, just because I think it's a nice way to emphasize how network-based diffusion analysis works. This <clears throat> diagram is redrawn from a study where the authors were interested in this behavior that dolphins were performing, um, which was uh, they were learning to cooperate with fishermen and they were indicating to fishermen where to find the fish and then the dolphins would, would um, uh, feed on the bycatch or play with the bycatch. So, <coughs> yeah, sorry. I had COVID recently and <clears throat> I have a terrible cough still. Um, <coughs> So, um, so the dolphins were learning this, this kind of quite lovely cooperative behavior, or lovely if you're not a fish, I guess. Um, and uh, the authors were interested in whether they were learning that behavior socially or whether they were just learning it for themselves. So network-based diffusion analysis assumes that if a behavior is being transmitted socially, its appearance should follow the connections of a social network. So for example, if this is the first dolphin to learn, then we'd expect the next ones to show the behavior to be these ones that are well connected to it. And the behavior should spread in that way through the social network. So that's, that's fundamentally how the technique works. I'll just show you what it looks like mathematically without expecting you to kind of follow the mathematics of it very much. <clears throat> or, well process, I'm not asking you to process them is what, uh, what I'm saying. Um, so if we wanted to, to model the rate at which an individual acquires a target behavior, so that's perhaps this cooperation with fishermen, or for a bee, it might be discovering a target feeder. Well, we expect that um, that rate will depend on how quickly it would have learned by itself. So that's the baseline learning rate. And then if the social interactions are doing something as well, while well, we also expect to depend on how connected that individual is to the individuals who have already found the feeder or learned to cooperate with a fisherman. And it will depend on how influential that social interaction is. So the strength of social uh, transmission. And that's this parameter S, which we estimate through network-based diffusion analysis. Oops. So that's the technique that we decided to apply here. And the nice thing about it is that you don't have to just use one network. You can put different networks into your model, the same way as you would into a GLM or anything like that. Um, and you can estimate how important the different networks are. So you can say, okay, the Waggle Dance Network is this important, say, give it a factor of nine or something like that. Uh, but the trophallactic network is, as, is one third as important as that, that kind of thing. We wanted to work out what those numbers actually were. <clears throat> so empirically what we did, or what Matt Hasenjäger, who's um, this person on the, on the top right here, what Matt did, um, he set up two feeders this is the grounds of, this is Royal Holloway in the background, and these are our honeybees trained to a feeder. Of course, the feeders aren't supposed to, um, they're supposed to represent something in the real world. So let's think of it more as a flowering cherry tree, a cherry tree that comes into flower. And at the moment, actually outside here, we have <clears throat> hundreds of these. So we have bees 
trained to Athena, and we have another, um, well, sorry, <clears throat> we, we have basically two equivalent feeders, think of them as two cherry trees, and uh, we have a group of bees trained to one, and a separate group of bees trained to the other one. And they're going backwards and forwards, and they're happy with their feeders. So <clears throat> what Matt did was then shut down one of the feeders, which creates a group of unemployed foragers who have lost their food source and they're looking for somewhere else to go. And happily for us, they're all marked. So, um, so we can <clears throat> work out who's who and who is following who. And in the hive, they're experiencing dances from the dancers who are at the other feeder. <clears throat> they're also getting trophallactic donations from them and they're able to smell them so that <clears throat> they can antenate them. And what Matt did was film uh, the inside of that hive because it's an observation hive or hives um, and build, uh, record the networks, the communication networks that the bees are forming and look at which ones best predict arrival at the, um, at the new feeder. <clears throat> so just to remind you what we're trying to estimate here, what we're looking at is <clears throat> this. We're trying to estimate the strength of social transmission for the different networks. Okay, what did we find? So we have the dance network, we have the trophallactic network, and we have the antenation network. And we're estimating the transmission parameter. How strong, how influential is each, say, waggle run followed? So this is what we found, or these are our estimates for, um, for the dance, for every waggle run followed, a bee is nearly 10 times more likely to arrive at the new feeder. So this is a really strong effect. For trophallaxis, hardly any effect at all and not a significant effect. And surprisingly also for antenation. So even though there's an awful lot of this going on, it doesn't seem to be increasing bees uh, chances of arriving at a new feeder. If we translate that into how many events are actually explained by, um, uh, how many arrivals at the feeder are actually explained by each, each um, communication type, you can see this translates into, the dance explained nearly 95% of arrivals at the new feeder. Trophallaxis again explained almost nothing. Antonation a little bit more. And you might think, well, why is that? Well, it's because there are a lot of antonation events. So even though it has a very small influence, it has, um, there are an awful lot of them, so it adds up. So this is showing that in, in this context, then the dance is really having far, far more influence than Oda is uh, um, arriving at the new feeder, which was really nice. We were, we were kind of pleased to find that. <coughs> but this is the context where you'd really expect the dance to, to have a, a, an influence, right? This is discovering new food. If it's going to be useful anywhere, it's going to be um, useful in that context. So we also wanted to look at reactivation to a particular feeder. And most of the dance following that goes on in the hive, is not actually unemployed bees trying to find new um, food sources, but bees that know where um, the food is and that are kind of checking <clears throat> whether their, whether their um, uh, current food source is still rewarding. So what did Matt find when he looked at how important the different networks were in the reactivation context? Well, so again, we have the dance network, the trophallactic network, and the antenation network. <clears throat> and here we see that the, the influence of dancing is actually much, much lower um, than it was before. And this translates into explaining only 15 percent of, uh, of arrivals at the known food source. Here, odour has become <clears throat> much more important, uh, and particularly antenation. So detecting those, um, those uh, scent cues on the bodies of other foragers seems to be what is driving uh, reactivation to the food source. So we have the dance being really important in the recruitment context, but uh, less important in the, uh, in the reactivation context where odor is, is more important. Okay, so 
what have we shown here? Well, we know that bees can use dances, there's no question about that, but we also knew that they often don't. And the reason why we want to know when it is that they do is because that's kind of what we need to know in, under to, in order to understand why it was that the dance evolved. Like what, wh when do bees actually use it? What is it being useful? In what context is it particularly useful? And here we found that it was most influential when searching out new resources. Now this is clearly um, a first step. Here we've looked at um, uh, moving between plants of the same species, one cherry tree to the next cherry tree. That's a, that's a, a, a situation where you'd expect the dance to be influential. And we've shown that it is, odor really isn't used in that context. So even though this is something that we really want to expand and we have been expanding to looking at switches between different species where we expect odor to, be, um, to take on more importance. <clears throat> what we've shown here is that this rapid switching between resources of the same species <clears throat> might have been a, a really important ecological context um, in the evolution of the dance language. This might be a context where it was particularly useful. <clears throat> and if we understand when it's useful, then we can understand perhaps, or start to understand why it is that, what it was about honeybee foraging ecology, which meant that the dance evolved in, in honeybees, but there's nothing similar in even a, a single other social insects, insect. Christoph mentioned that um, at one point I studied honey wasps. That's because I was interested to see if honey wasps had anything similar to the dance because they have a very similar foraging ecology. <clears throat> um, we found nothing, even in a species like that, they didn't really seem to have very much in the way of recruitment. So, <clears throat> uh, so that was a kind of um, proximate approach to understanding the evolution of a foraging trait. We're looking at how it works, when, when is it used? In the second part of my talk, I want to present a, a more ultimate approach and um, looking at what drives the evolution of a particular foraging trait. What kind of ecological circumstances were important in its evolution? And the um, traits that I'm talking about or collection of traits are individual level of cognition, so learning and memory. I already mentioned at the, at the beginning of the talk that bees seem to be particularly good <clears throat> at learning and memory, all sorts of them, uh, particularly uh, <clears throat> unusual cognitive tasks. Um, they seem to be very good at it. They're in their, uh, the <clears throat> oh dear, really can't speak, I'm sorry. <laughs> This is actually much better than it was about um, three weeks ago. But anyway, so in the in the bee brain, about 20% of the neuropile is devoted to the mushroom bodies, which are important in learning and memory. Um, that in the Drosophila brain, that's about 2%. So there really does seem to be something an, uh, special or unusual going on here. Now, learning and memory is, or oh, as a collection of traits seems to be something that you would expect to be kind of useful for all animals really but we don't i mean anything that can help you make good decisions uh, keep you up to date about the state of the environment should be useful but we don't see universal evolution towards some sort of mega brain so it must be that there are some contexts where <laughs> investing in memory pays off and some contexts where <laughs> And the benefits don't necessarily outweigh the quite significant energetic costs. So we were interested in what kind of environments or what is it about the tasks that the bees face that, um, <clears throat> that particularly render um, using your memory useful. And <clears throat> we were thinking about the different environments that a bee can face or that any animal could face. And we were thinking, well, perhaps it could be the case that um, memory is particularly important when you're foraging in a rich environment. So <clears throat> something like this meadow, it's very complex, uh, particularly in a, in a spring context. You think that perhaps those animals with good memory, perhaps in this kind of context, they can excel. They can collect a lot more food than those uh, their, their kind of poorer counterparts. <clears throat> and that's perhaps what you predict from some of the bee literature. But from the rest of the animal kingdom, most of the evidence seems to show that investment in cognition pays off in harsh environments. So 
in environments where it's hard to find food, then you'd expect uh, that those animals that can use uh, their cognitive abilities to improve foraging efficiency, um, that, that, that should lead to evolution of better memory. So we have two alternative hypotheses there. <clears throat> Perhaps um, animals with good memory do better in harsh, in harsh environments, or alternatively, perhaps they do better in rich, complex environments. And <clears throat> that's what we wanted to test in this experiment. We wanted to take a particular cognitive trait and see in which, which type of environment does it pay off? Does it result in better foraging efficiency? How did we test cognition here? Well, I'm gonna go into later exactly what cognitive trait we're testing here, <clears throat> but I want to show you the type of equipment that we use, the type of assay we do, which is a razor alarm maze. Razor alarm maze is a, is a classic um, uh, protocol <clears throat> developed for, um, for toxicology study and studies in rats looking at um, what is usually referred to in vertebrates as working memory. And it works like this. So the bee enters the maze here and she flies to the first um, <clears throat> one of the arms of the mazes, uh, one of the maze arms, uh, and lands on a landing platform, which is larger up here. And you can see she sticks her proboscis through the hole and she gets a little drop of nectar, which is waiting for her here, or sucrose solution even. And then she, has, she goes to one of the other arms, let's say this one, and she does the same thing. So she gets a reward for going there. And then she comes out of here, she has to decide which arm do I go to next. If she goes back to this one, well, this one is empty because she's already drained it. So if she revisits that, she's effectively making a mistake. But if she can remember which arm she's visited, then uh, she can increase her efficiency. So we can count how good is her, well, we can count the number of arms that she revisits as an assay of how good her working memory is. Okay, so if she makes eight revisits when she's trying to collect all the nectar from these um, forearms, then we could say she has quite a poor working memory, whereas if she <clears throat> makes only one, then um, she has a, we can say she's got a good memory. Now you might be thinking, well, there's several other ways that a bee can solve a maze like that. I mean, you could just turn left every time you come out. And uh, I'm not going to go into how we show that bees use memory to do this, but um, I've got got a slide that I can show everyone afterwards if they'd like to see. And um, so just to show you that we did validate this maze to, to show that bees are using memory. We also remove these little platforms every time a bee visits and replace them with clean ones so she can't use 10 marks. So for every bee, we can gain a, uh, a what we call a RAM score, a radial arm maze score. <coughs> and then we can take that bee and we can allow her to forage outside. So we connect up, once we've tested all the bees in a colony, we can connect up the colony, we keep it in the lab, but we allow the bees to forage outside in the environment surrounding Royal Holloway. And we measure their weight on the way in and the way out and how long they take as an assay of their foraging efficiency. So we have a predictor, we have RAM score, memory, and we have, um, uh, a response variable for foraging efficiency. Just to show you what these look like in real life. So this is the raisin alarm maze in the lab. This is Chris Poole who did um, all of these experiments or led the experiments. Um, and then this is, our, uh, this is our setup where the bees um, exit the lab and forage in the wild. So this colony here will have already been through all the, all the bees that we're going to test in it have been tested and they're now being allowed to forage outside. And they're allowed to forage outside for four weeks over the course of uh, which we track their foraging efficiency. Okay, so we have, like I said, the predictor variable, memory, we have foraging efficiency, but we're not just interested in, does memory predict foraging efficiency? We're interested in, does memory predict foraging efficiency more in certain environments, in harsh environments, let's say. So we did this, we did it over two years actually, but we capitalize on the temporal variation in resource availability that we see around Royal Holloway and that we see in, in them, yeah, basically in most um, semi-urban environments. So in the spring, 
we have very rich resources and in the summer we <clears throat> see a gradual decline in um, uh, floral abundance and diversity uh, until kind of July or in August and then goes up again slightly in October when the when the ivy comes out again. So we're doing this across the whole year and we're doing it with 27 different colonies so they all they're all they all go through this at a different time of year. Colony one starts in the spring, colony two starts two weeks later, colony three starts three weeks later. Now please bear in mind that these colonies are as identical as we could possibly make them. So they're commercially raised colonies. They, the, the queens are not wild caught. They're not spring queens versus late queens. They're queens that have been raised in absolutely identical conditions. They're parasite free and we've done absolutely everything we can to make the colonies as identical to each other as they can be. So they have standardized food resources before they go outside, all that kind of thing. And they're the same size. So what do we find? So just to remind you what we're looking for, we're looking at the relationship between working, uh, between RAM score and between foraging efficiency. So we're gonna look on axes like this up here. So this is nectar foraging efficiency, how, how good a forager you are, basically. It's transformed, that's why it goes from minus three to plus three. And then along here, we've got your, um, your memory performance. Yeah, so this is good, low score, uh, not many revisits, and this is bad. Yeah, so you're a, a B who's bad at, um, you, you're basically a B with a bad memory if you've got a high score here. And these are through the, the months of the year. So if, for example, um, working memory pays off in a harsh environment, we might expect to see something like this. Yeah, so in the harsh, uh, sorry, in the, the summer, when there's not much food around, those bees with a good memory are doing well, and those bees with a bad memory are doing poorly. And in the spring, there's loads of food around for everybody, and um, so it doesn't really matter how good your memory is. You don't have to be particularly skilled to get a lot of food. So we might expect to see something like this. And to be honest, this is what we, what we predicted um, before we started the experiment. What we actually saw when we analyzed these two years of data uh, look more like this, which was a surprise for us. So you can see here, we do see circumstances where bees with a better memory are foraging more efficiently, but those circumstances tend to be in the spring, in the rich environments, the complex environments, and the relationship actually reverses as we get through to the, to the summer. Uh, so the rich environments where the higher scoring bees do better. Now, <clears throat> one thing that I should point out is that um, obviously working memory score could correlate with a whole number of other variables, like for example, bee size, bee age. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into how we standardized all of those, uh, but we were very careful to check um, that there is no uh, collinearity between any of our predictor variables here. And in fact, B size doesn't predict um, working memory score. So we're confident that this isn't, isn't the result of a correlation with another variable that we measured. Of course, we can't be sure about variables that we didn't measure. Um, <clears throat> we think we got as far as close as we possibly can be in a correlational study to being able to identify that working memory is, the, is a key driver here. Anyway, so we showed that higher scorer, scoring bees did better in the spring, but worse in the summer. And I've been talking about spring environments as being the rich environments. Well, can we really be sure that, um, that that's the case? We live in an urban area, so perhaps um, uh, urban gardens are, are slightly different in that way. Well, to be sure about that, we went out and sampled um, gardens around Royal Holloway and woodlands and parkland. Um, throughout our experiment, once a week, we devoted to <clears throat> going outside and uh, with a lot of quadrats. And just to show you um, the kind of results that we got from that. So <clears throat> this, is, um, this is generic richness up here. 
and uh, these are the different types of land use that we studied so for example this is open woodland um, this is grassland and you can see that generally we see a decline in um, the number of genera that are in flower um, across the season we see something slightly different going on with um, the urban gardens so we did see more of a, a peak kind of in the in the um, later spring early summer there but overall we saw a declining trend in the number of species in flower. When we look at the pollen, the number of species represented in the pollen that the bees were bringing back, we see a very kind of uh, general decline. In, so we spent a lot of time analyzing um, pollen grains and the microscope to see what was there. But for me, the most important thing is that we saw bout duration going up very noticeably. So bees, when faced with the same task, were taking a lot longer to do it in the kind of summertime than they were in the early spring. So they were coming back with the, <clears throat> with the um, same amount of food, but um, taking longer to do it. So we we're fairly convinced that our rich environments are the spring environments and the harder time to find food is the summer. Okay, so why do we find this kind of result? Well, I mean, like I said, we were, to be honest, initially surprised because we expected the harsh environments to be the ones where memory really pays off. But I think the key, the key thing to um, bear in mind here is the kind of task that we presented our bees with. So the radialarm maze task, it's hard to say exactly what that tests, although, as I said, invertebrates is considered a test of working memory. In, in, when we think about memory in bees, well, memory in bees is very well characterized. This is a diagram um, from Randolph, Randolph Menzel's work um, that I took from a review paper he published in, in 2013. And you can see in these very well characterized different phases of memory. <clears throat> so we have short term memory, which lasts for up to about 15 minutes after stimulus exposure, and then medium term memory, which is more in the course of hours. And then between days, we expect long-term memory to be more important. Um, so our radial arm maze task, well, we expect it, it's really a test of short-term memory. Yeah, you have to remember which arm you've just visited. You don't have to remember that between foraging bouts. Yeah, so the bee, each bee con uh, completes several different bouts on the round, including um, cases where she has to learn how the radial arm maze works. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so, yeah, so really we're testing this, this short term memory here. Now, in the real world, what is short term memory going to be important for? Well, we expect it to be important for within patch decisions rather than between patch decisions. Just to look at a diagram of what that might look like, if this is a bumblebee colony here and she's in a rich environment, so there's an awful lot of flower patches out there then, well, it's these kind of jumps within patches where she can remember which flower she's already visited or remember what flower type it was and try to visit the same flower type in her next visit within the patch. It's these within patch decisions which we expect to be important. And <clears throat> relative to um, when she's foraging in the summer, quite a lot of the foraging will be within patches. In the summer, for example, we can hypothesize that foraging is going to be dominated by longer trips between patches, longer trips to find the patch in the first place, view of flowers within the patch, having to travel to another patch. And these within patch savings that are brought about by short term memory could be dwarfed by the, um, uh, these long travel times between patches yeah if, if your savings are in the region of you know fractions of a second and you're spending many seconds or even minutes traveling between patches then you don't expect to see those savings so that was <clears throat> one idea about why we might be seeing this effect um i so far i mean it's an idea but we haven't really tested it so we don't know why we're, or we're not trying to say that this is uh, this is definitely why we see this effect why um, uh, rich environments seem to be more beneficial for, or short-term memory is more beneficial in short in rich environments. Um, but uh, it's an idea that we have. 
So to sum that up, we showed that uh, it may be rich environments rather than harsh environments that select for better short-term memory. Now, because we did this in bees, it has quite an interesting, um, or where different bees within the colony might have um, different abilities. So you might have bees that are good at, have good short-term memory that are, um, you know, that would be useful in the rich environments. Those with better long-term memory, uh, that's useful in the, in the sparse environments. Creates all kind of interesting questions about um, colony dynamics. Um, but I'm not going to go into those now. I'll leave them for the for the question time if anyone's interested. Um, so that just leaves me to somewhat what I've said, which was I talked about the waggle dance. I talked about how um, it seems to drive um, recruitment, but not necessarily food rediscovery. And I talked about how ecology might shape the evolution of short term memory as measured by the rate of arm maze in bumblebees. That leaves me just to thank the people that did most of the empirical work here. So that's um, Matt Hazenjäger here and Will Hoppet, who did our mathematical modeling for us. Um, this is Chris Poole, who did our bumblebee experiment, and Irina Petkova, who was the technical support for that. And um, to thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali, for this very interesting talk. Um, do we have any questions? So if you have a question, please feel free to raise your virtual hand and ask Maggie directly or write the question in the chat. Yes, um, Felicity has a question. Hi, um, great talk. I'm sorry that you still got a COVID cough. That sounds terrible. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the second study I find, I thought that was an excellent paper and I really thought it was super interesting. One thing I was wondering about just as you were talking, I haven't really thought this through fully, but with the bees that you were testing, they, they weren't kind of naive bees, right? They're bees that are, that are going out and foraging, of course, because you're measuring the, the colony's foraging efficiency. I was trying to think through how their experiences in these two different environments might affect their cognitive abilities that you're measuring. I was, have you kind of thought through that? Yeah, sure. Um, I have thought through it. And the reason I have Felicity is because uh, I remember you um, raising that as a criticism of a previous paper that uh, I think we, oh, did I? <laughs> and we thought about it before the experiment. Um, but actually in this experiment, so we're not measuring them at the same time. When we measure, um, uh, radial arm maze performance, those bees have never ever been outside. So that takes kind of two weeks um, and then they go outside. So their experience before the, before the testing is always um, exactly the same. And then they go outside and uh, yes, at that point, they're going to kind of accumulate different experiences and things which would affect their score if we, if we tested them later. Um, but hopefully it doesn't make a difference for, for our experiment. Well, and then I do have another question if nobody else has one right now. I was just wondering about um, the, the relationship between the foraging efficiency and uh, the performance on the task. It looks like, like a linear relationship, but because of the transformed axes, I was wondering if it is a linear relationship or not. Um, which aspects being linear, sorry? Sorry, that like uh, on the graphs uh, across from spring to summer, where uh, you have on the x-axis the, the foraging efficiency measure on the on the on, sorry on the y-axis the foraging efficiency on the x-axis their performance in the radial arm maze. Uh, that both of those axes are, are transformed values. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's a, a hang on. I can go to it. Here it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering on on an untransformed axis, what the shape of that relationship is. Yeah, um, so the I mean, the transformation shrinks the relationship because it's log transformation, um, although they're both transformed, but let's ignore that for now, right? Um, so if you, if you use the untransformed data, which we are actually considering um, doing because I don't like using the transformation so much, um, but the relationship is almost exactly the same, just more pronounced if you use a, an untransformed one. Cool, thank you. 
And we have another question by Andrew. Hi, thanks um, for your really interesting talk. Um, in the first part of your talk, you discussed the, your, your conclusion was that the, uh, if I got this right, essentially the effectiveness of waggle dance was highest when bees were switching between resources or when the current resources were maybe uh, less optimal. Um, and I, I wonder if you um, could say any more about whether, for example, that would be, the, the change in that would be carried by the bee doing the dance or the bees receiving the dance, if this would reflect like the overall colony uh, kind of status. Um, and if you phrase it as like the rate of success of, of the per dance, then it, it's not just that they're that they're dancing more or less, or or could that mm. could that be it as as well? Um, yeah, so it's a, a really nice question. So essentially, is it is it the bees um, that are dancing that are driving this kind of increase in effectiveness of the dance, or is it the followers? Um, well, I'd say it's the followers um, simply because we looked, um, what we do is measure the effectiveness of each, of each waggle run uh, at sending the, the followers to the food source. So even if they were doing more waggle runs, which I mean, they, they don't, they do the same kind of for the, if the resources of a particular quality, then they do the same number of waggle runs, right? It doesn't matter what they're trying to recruit the other bees for, but because we looked at it for, um, uh, in terms of, you know, how effective is each waggle run? Um, then I think, yeah, we're fairly confident that it's the, it's the, how the, how the followers respond to the information rather than how the dancers provide it. Okay, um, I guess then, then the question is, um, but maybe you don't know the answer, but so, so what would be changing in them? I mean, how, why would the receptivity to the dance then be different in that case? Um, I guess, um, well, yes, you're right. I don't know the answer to that. I suppose what we've done is identify that their mo motivation appears to change or that the, um, yeah, the, the effectiveness of the dance on them seems to change, but we don't know why. We don't know physiologically what's going on in inside. <laughs> like, um, so yes, you're right. I don't, I don't know the answer to that yet. We know it's changing, but we don't know why. But you, maybe simpler. I mean, do you, would it be? Do you think it'd be something simple, like like they're 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 hungry, they're starved, um, or? Um. Well, I mean. My intuition that is that it wouldn't be hunger because you know they have for a start they're foraging for the colony rather than for themselves. Um, in terms of satiation, I, I like as in I mean they all have empty crops by the time they're following the dance as well. Yeah. I think. Um, so yeah, it's hard to it's hard to see exactly what it could be. I don't have any like clear idea of of what the kind of driver could be. Um, but you know. I'd, yeah, I'd love to hear about if anybody does have any ideas about what it could be. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question by Kate Anton. Hello, thank you for a great talk. Um, I was just wondering, did you look at any cognitive differences between spring, spring bees and winter bees because they're physiologically different? I wondered if that could be a component. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's something that we thought about very, um, very carefully, actually, because it's, it's um, f when people have done these studies in birds, that's a, a big criticism of them, right, that, you know, animals at different times of the year are very different. And that's why we kind of, aside from the fact that we study bees, but that's why I originally thought, okay, bees would be a great mod model to do this in, because we can create individuals that are as kind of they're not really spring bees right and that's because of this uh, you know commercial rearing situation that we have so these bees despite it being summer then um we can have we can create colonies that are like kind of natural early spring colonies the bees are from queens that have always been in the lab kind of thing and their and their grandmothers have always been in the lab they have no idea that it or physiological idea that it's actually 
summer or spring outside kind of thing because they've never never been there so we're, we're starting off with bees that are kind of um a seasonal in what in some respects i guess you can test that now looking at your learning data you can see whether there's a change throughout yes. the reason yeah yeah. Uh -huh, yeah i should have a diagram shouldn't i <laughs> yeah um okay so we have another question by jack hargrave Hi, Ellie. Um, thanks for a great talk. Unfortunately, my camera's not working for some reason. Um, I was just wondering about the network analysis. Obviously, there'll be some bees that might be in both networks at once. So they might be in the antenation and the dancing network. I wonder if there's any way to kind of quantify that and see if they are maybe additive or more than that. Yeah. Um... That's a yes, thank you. That's a, something that the reviewers brought up actually. And uh, in fact, every bee is in both networks because they all engage in so well. There might be a couple that are not in the trophallactic, trophallactic network, but um, all of these interaction are, uh, interactions are going on for all bees at all the time. Um, so we did kind of, it's quite diff difficult with the NBDA approach to, um, to kind of put an interaction in there. Um, uh, but we managed it and we didn't put it in the final publication just because um, the number of parameters are huge, but we found no effect. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it, it, it's, it's interesting because you would expect that perhaps the, um, you know, the effectiveness of the dance depends on whether you've also had kind of olfactory information telling you the same thing. But we didn't find any evidence for that. Later, we had a look at, um, we used, um, a similar setup but we use kind of different centered resources and we haven't kind of finally finished the analysis from that um so i um that's why i haven't presented it yet um but what we were finding with that was again we're not we weren't seeing any kind of um synergistic interactions um but what we were seeing was the bees were kind of organizing themselves according to the scent so even though the waggle dance wouldn't have more effect if you were if it came from the same scented resource as the one that you were interested in, um, then you were you were only likely to follow a dancer that follow that was um, that smelled of the resource that you were interested in. So it's kind of like a rather than a synergistic effect, it's a kind of organizational effect. Um, so yeah, not synergy in the classic way, but um, there is something going on there. Great, thank you very much. And you have a question by uh, Gart Otis. Yes, hi, good morning, and thanks for the talk. That was great. Um, honeybee stuff. There are a couple previous studies. I just wonder if you could put your results or think about them in context with one was a study by George Gamboa and one of his students where they showed that I seem to suggest that only the bees that are directly behind the dancing bee actually are influenced by the dance and if they're at the sides of the bee it doesn't seem to influence them so I wondered if that got incorporated mm. in, in your thinking and the other one was a study by Kurt Vischer and one of his students where they looked at the importance of olfaction versus dance in the bees foraging and and there were times of year when there was tons of resources when the bees seemed to only use olfaction to uh, find new resources Whereas when resources were much less abundant, they used the relied on the dance much more. So I just throw those out there and wonder how they fit into your results. Yeah, um, thank you. So the first one, so the the Gamboa, um, we hadn't. Um, so no, we hadn't considered uh, whether you're kind of at the um, you know the rear of the dancer or the side of the dancer at all. And it is something that we could put in. What we could have if we had noted if the um, if the bees were kind of at the side or not, um, uh, it, it would be interesting to do. But we would we don't have the data to do it at the moment because we haven't noted that down. But yeah, I think that would be an interesting application. Um, the second question about so what's well, kind of effectively how how well do these are like these results likely to hold across different contexts? And um, I see I see this study. So my answer to that is that. I, I don't think they're likely to hold across different contexts. What we want to do is use this as a, as a tool. So the NBDA approach, use it in different contexts. So perhaps different times of year when um, resources are hard to find or easy to find. And um, in that way, get a picture of when it is that the, the bees are actually using the dance and a, a, a quantitative picture 
kind of relative to odor rather than are they using it and are they not using it. The main hurdle that we have for that is um, all these dances were um, decoded, uh, all, all of these networks were built by, um, by watching the videos. Um, and that's clearly something that we can't do on the kind of scale that we'd need to expand this to different contexts. So we need to get on board with the, uh, you know, um, automatic tracking and um, do it like that, basically. That's the only hurdle that we have. And just as I think Maggie kind of in her talk, she kind of uh, said, oh, well, Tim Gernard's kind of approach is going to help us with that. Then, and that's how I feel as well. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions in the chat and a couple um, in person. So maybe first the in person by Vidur. You're you're mute still. Uh, so when it comes to like the dance in information being more important for recruitment to a new resource compared to uh, reactivation. I suppose that could be explained by uh, like when it's reactivation, the the foragers are using their own memory. And so they at that point in time, like ra rather than dance being less important among social transmitted information, socially transmitted information itself becomes less important, maybe. So uh, so it could be that the chemical cues just activate the bees' as private memories. Uh, what would you say about that? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, and, and we would expect that, you know, memory is the main driver here, right? Rather than kind of waggle, waggle dance interactions or anything like that. There's no point in kind of reading where to go over and over again, if you already know. Um, one of the things that I didn't go into um, because there isn't really, there wasn't really time is that we also include, so we estimate the um, contribution of kind of asocial learning, um, just uh, so we include a network where kind of the, the connections are totally random um, and we um, estimate how important that network is in driving interactions and actually we surprisingly we found that the rate of asocial learning or like just discovering the feeder by yourself even for the reactivation situation is really low and that's probably just because you know most bees do follow they either um, antenate another bee or they get an extra donation or they follow a dance before they go out so there just aren't very many cases where they don't do it so it's hard to estimate exactly um how important that is um so I guess what I'm trying to say is we do include, we estimate asocial learning in our models, um, but we have very little, the, the, the power of it isn't great because there aren't many bees who just asocially learn. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, now, very briefly, a question in the chat that I'm gonna read um, by uh, Margarita Orlova. Were the trials in every month performed with the workers from the first batch laid by the queen? And also were all bees in the trials reared by an equivalent number of caretakers? Um, so this is about the bumblebee study. Um, and the answer to that is no, um, then they're not. So we can't um, control exactly how many workers um, uh, rear um, the brood at each stage. Um, the reason why we don't think that's a, a, an issue is because there are so many bees. So we um, we tested something like over 400 bees on the radial arm maze, and, thing, and there's no systematic bias. So you know, it's not it's not like in sp for the spring bees we used the first brood of workers. In fact, um, we we used kind of almost random workers from the colony. It just depended on you know if if we were in the second week of testing. We, we had to just go with whatever bees were motivated to, to forage at that particular time. So it's kind of like, there's no systematic bias in there, but we can't, we couldn't make everything absolutely perfectly matched, I think. But it's not that the spring ones were early and the summer ones were later or anything like that. Okay, then we have a question by Tim Gernot. Hi Maggie, uh, not Maggie, I'm sorry. I've, uh... 
<laughs> and meeting with someone else before. Hi, Ali. I have a uh, question um, about the negative relationship between performance in the radial arm race and uh, forging efficiency uh, that we see here in uh, October. Uh, I was surprised to see that because I would uh, naively uh, have assumed that um, if this really is about short term memory, then um, if it's not helpful, there would be no relationship. But it looks like uh, good performance in the maze um, is negatively associated with forging efficiency. I was wondering whether you have any uh, hypotheses about that. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because it's my biggest bugbear, to be honest, at the moment. Um, so, uh, so what you're pointing out is that really we expect this line to be flat in uh, yeah. late summer, right? And, and it actually looks like having a good short-term memory is harming you um, at that point. Mm -hmm. And then, so uh, there are a couple of things that we've thought about with that, and both of them need further testing. Um, the first one is that it's possible there's a trade-off between short-term and long-term memory. So we know that in Drosophila, anesthesia-resistant memory, which is a one-trial memory, um, uh, does trade off with long-term memory. And in, when patches are widely dispersed, we expect long-term memory to, to dominate foraging. Yeah. So for me, that makes sense, but it also feels a little contrived. So um, that's something that we would really like to test. And the other thing that's um, kind of come up with, uh, I mean, it, it could simply be that, you know, you're investing in good short-term memory does come at an energetic cost, which, which um, leads to, you know, has um, consequences for other metabolic traits. So for example, you just, you know, you're less equipped to fly for a long time kind of thing. You have to go back to the colony more quickly or something like that. We didn't find any effect on survival. So it's not like those bees that had good memory were um, less likely to survive. So um, yeah, we don't know yet. It's opened up more more questions for us. Um, but yeah, that's, I kind of feel like that's what it should do, right? We don't yeah. want to stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, also, thanks for a very interesting talk. Thanks. And Axel has a uh, question. I actually have a, a similar question to Tim. Um, you showed um, th that you measured uh, foraging trip time. And I was wondering whether you kind of measured this for the bees that you had tested in the radial maze and whether you found a difference between the, the good short term and the bad short term uh, bees in the foraging trip time. Um, yes, we did actually. So we um, so the diagram that I showed, I think, was for all bees. Um, but we did we were looking at we would we did try to break it down and see is it that they're collecting more food in the same time or is it that they're taking less time to collect the same amount of food. So the bees with a good memory say, um, and we didn't find any clear relationship there um, from memory, although I'd have to check. Um, it seemed like they were, um, oh no, hang on. I, no, I don't want, uh, I don't want to, to misremember, but um, uh, I think it was the case that they were taking the same amount of, uh, sorry, they were collecting um, the, bat, the bees that forage less efficiently were taking longer and, and collecting the same amount of food but I'd have to check. Okay, and then another question. Um, did you put uh, the bees into the freezer? That one, I mean, would there be kind of like, a, I mean, probably there is not, but a kind of a molecular, molecular uh, marker for a kind of sh uh, sh a better short-term memory than a mm. uh, 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 not so good one. So kind of to confirm in some sense on a molecular basis that what you found was kind of like uh, improved short-term memory. Mm, yeah, um, uh, it would be nice to do that. We don't have them in the freezer because we measured survival. So we had to wait till they actually died. Like, and then they're out in the in the wild somewhere. Um, I mean, what we have, we've been trying to do is um, do immunostaining of the mushroom bodies and look at microglomerulus density and how that correlates with um, RAM performance. But we don't have any results for that yet. Um, yeah, it, it would be nice. I would also like to see how, um, you know, RAM performance, whether it predicts um, uh, cognitive performance in other tasks as well. So something to kind of show 
yeah, what, what is this that we're really testing? I think because the radio arm maze isn't a perfect test of short term memory. Um, it's yeah, I would like to know exactly what cognitive trait we're focusing on here. OK, thanks. Um, we have one more question in the chat, um, again by Margarita. So were colonies of all stages of development represented equally in all trials? Um, <laughs> so the colonies are at exactly the same stage of development when they go into the testing period um, and when they go into the foraging period. So they have, uh, I think it was, was it two weeks in the lab um, before they start testing, two weeks of testing, and then they forage in the field. So um, uh, from, from a kind of design point of view, then yes, they are at exactly the same stages. Now, of course, colonies do develop at, uh, at um, uh, uh, different rates. So um, you could expect that, yes, there, were, they would be, um, there won't be exactly the same number of workers in each one. The key point is that um, it's not the case that they're always smaller in the spring or always larger in the summer. Um, so we did as much as we could to standardize the colonies, yes. Okay, then maybe I um, ask a question. So I had a very simplistic idea um, and I was just wondering if it makes sense. So when you show that in a rich environment, learning performance is more important, I was then thinking this is because in the rich environment, there is a lot to learn. Whereas in a poor environment, if you don't have many options, you don't need to learn a lot. It doesn't explain why it's the other way around, but it makes them sense why it's in a rich environment where learning is especially important. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, intuitively, that's kind of, um, it is what you would expect if it allows you to excel kind of thing. But you would also imagine in a, well, in a poor environment, the poor environment isn't just about the number of resources, right? It's about where to find them and, um, you know, remembering where they are. And that I know definitely in, in the bird studies, then um, memory seems to help in the harsh environments kind of thing. So it's like, mm -hmm. I guess it's the kind of like, remember it or you've, you've got no food at all, kind of thing. Um, so um, yes, I think, I think you're probably right. It probably is that, you know, they excel in the rich environments because they've got a, a good memory, but um, yeah, I'm not sure yet. I don't have a good yeah. explanation for it yet. Okay, are there any other questions left?